Bismillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah. Excellencies, friends of the Dar, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Tonight's speaker, as many of you know, is a special friend of Dar al-Athar al-Islamiyya. And it is the pleasure of the Dar to welcome him back to Kuwait. As the German ambassador, Dr. Werner Doam served in Kuwait until mid-2004, and during that time, he was a steadfast participant in the DAR's activities. His thoughtful involvement in the question and answer period after each weekly lecture contributed much to our understanding. You expected me to say something else. <laughs> Dr. Doam returned to Kuwait in 2005, this time to participate in the DAR's 10th cultural season, where he delivered a lecture entitled The Queen of Saba in, the, in History and Art. Tonight, he visits Kuwait again, this time to discuss war and trade during the Crusades and the role of the Indian Ocean. This is the first time that I can recall that we had a talk that combines the Crusades with trade in the Indian Ocean. It is not, however, the first time that we have asked you to turn off items that were not used in war and Crusades, namely your mobile phones. So be kind and turn them off. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Duan. شكرا للاحباد لهذه لهذا المدخل للمحاضره وللمحاضر انا اشكركم اي اولسو ثانك ايفريبودي هو هاز كم تو نايت اند ات از فيري سبيشال بليجر تو بي هير ان كويت اند تو سي سو ماني فيسز ويتش وي وير ميسينغ اوفر ذا ييرز I just look left and right from Saeed Shihata to Ghad al Qadumi to so many friends who have shared with us the pleasure and the extraordinary initiative, which is, and Geza, <laughs> slightly in the dark, um, the extraordinary pleasures which are offered by Dar al Asar al Islamiyya during our stay here in Kuwait. Pleasures that are built on Elm on Tafahum and on building bridges. Thank you so much for coming. And I will start right away with my talk, which indeed, as uh, our friend Brother has said, sounds a bit strange, but I hope I will be able, at least, if not to convince you, to open your minds to a different view of history. Trade between let us put it, the Mediterranean world and the Indian Ocean or the eastern part of the Indian Ocean, which is India, has a very long history. <coughs> the earliest examples we can uh, quantify and, uh, and identify have come from Mesopotamia and from Phylaka. Um, there were, Phylaka was a trading post which in the late third millennium and early second millennium BC, of course, connected Mesopotamia with the northern part of India, um, the so-called Harappa cultures. This trade did not end in late antiquity, it flourished particularly in the Roman times when Rome in the year 26 BC conquered Egypt. Rome became a partner of the trade looking southward through the Red Sea and towards India. We do have, we do have documents of that period which detail the goods and the trade routes along 
the shores of the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean. Even in the centuries following the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, when the Germanic tribes conquered Europe, trade to a much smaller extent continued. You may all have seen pictures or in museums of the famous Germanic garnet jewelry of the 6th, 7th and 8th centuries. These garnets were imported from Sri Lanka. The population in Europe increased dramatically in the years between Charlemagne and the High Middle Ages. In the year 700, Europe had a total of 27 million inhabitants. In the year 1300, 70 million, the same number as the Roman Empire a thousand years before. The most considerable increase in population was in the 50 years, the first half of the 13th century. This is, in my view and in the view of many, the main reason for the expansion of Europe and for, among others, the Crusades. The Crusades were not a conflict between Christianity and Islam, nor were they a conflict between Europe and the Middle East. Alliances shifted, but trade, which is the basis of living together or living apart, trade continued. I will begin slightly earlier. I will begin in the 10th, 11th, and early 12th century. This is the period of the very first large international trade after antiquity. It was centered in two places, in Cairo and in Aden. Aden, which from now on I will pronounce the correct way, Aden. Aden is a very old town. When I was there, I still saw, unfortunately they have disappeared today, the tombs of Cain and Abel. They may not have been there any longer, but anyway, their tombs were still there. The trade of the 11th and early or two-thirds of the 12th century is known to us through an extraordinary collection of documents which are called the Geniza documents. The Geniza documents are called after the Cairo Geniza, a Cairo synagogue which was built in around 1020 and which had a secret place where documents and letters which contained, might have contained the name of God, and of course every letter among Muslims and Jews contained the word God, at least in the beginning, may God bless you. So discarded documents of this kind by the Jewish merchant families in Cairo were kept and disposed of in that small room in the Geniza. This is a very pious custom, which of course, as many of you might know, was also observed in the Muslim world. I have myself still seen, when I was a bit younger, in rural Yemen, Jenazas, or Maqbarat al-Mahtutat, Maqabir al-Mahtutat, in small country mosques were papers and documents containing the word God were disposed of, and many of you know of the biggest such find of a janaza 
if we may say so, which is the same word in Hebrew and in Arabic, has been discovered in the great mosque in Sana'a. The documents of the Cairo Geniza were dispersed at the end of the 19th century and acquired, fortunately, by a number of learned institutions. Most of them are now in Cambridge, in England, in Oxford, and in other places, in Budapest, in Washington, in Boston, and in other public libraries. From these approximately 100,000 fragments of business letters, we can reconstruct the first wave of world global trade between Cairo, Aden, India, Malaysia, and beyond, and from Cairo and Alexandria towards Tunisia, Sicily, Italy, and beyond into Europe, we even found, or not we, but some scholars found about three or four years ago in a fragment of the Cairo Geniza, a German, short German text which had slipped into that paper in Cairo. The extent of this trade was truly worldwide. We have, for instance, approximately 60 documents of the Cairo merchant family Ben Yiju, originally a Tunisian Jew from Mahdia, whose family had this merchant business in Cairo. Part of his family were established in Aden, and a certain and a member of the family, Abraham bin Yiju, went from Aden to India, where he established in the Malabar coast a bronze factory. For instance, we have a letter from 1139 from Aden to India, where his representative in Aden, the Nuhada ibn Abi al Qataib, writes him, I have received your iron. His business partner says in another letter, from Nuhada Joseph, I received two basins, two ewers, and two candlesticks. Thank you for the delivery. And then it goes on, but the ship of Sheikh Abu al-Hassan bin Jafar sank. Divers recovered approximately half of the iron cargo, but all the pepper was lost. And we have documents which show how this lost was then treated in court by mediation and shared with the other partners in that particular venture so that the whole loss was pro rata shared by the various owners of the goods transported. A very detailed letter of the year 1140 goes from Aden to India and says, please produce an, a ewer, a lamp, and several basins, and a ma'ashira. And very detailed details are being given how these objects should be produced. Then the letter continues, I'll send you scrap metal, this and that quantity. And um, please, if you need more metal, just deduct it from your invoice. I will not go into more detail, as we are going to concentrate on the subsequent period, the mainly Islamic trade. We should still not forget that while we have all the documentation for this early 10th, 11th, early 12th century period from Jewish documents from Cairo, we should not forget that this is most probably just a glimpse and that the very great majority of the India and beyond trade, even in that period, was in the hand of Muslim merchant families established in Cairo and Aden. We come now to the period which you have seen in the title, the Crusades. The Crusades are, of course, intimately linked with the Ayyubids 
of whom the most prominent and well-known figure is, of course, Salahuddin Saladin. The, I will not go into the details of the rise of the Ayyubids from Syria and how they came to Egypt, but just mention a few dates. In the year 1171, Saladin dissolved the still formally existing Fatimid Caliphate in Cairo and established himself firmly in Egypt. Two years, one year later, in 1172, a mutiny of the Nubian soldiers, of the Egyptian Nubian soldiers, forced him to send his brother, Turan Shah, to Upper Egypt and into Sudan in order to subdue not only the mutiny, but also Upper Egypt, Northern Sudan. This may have been the spark which led Saladin to turn his eyes totally southward. But I would say that there was another reason. There was another reason. There were two Shia kingdoms in Yemen, the Sulahids and the Beni Zuraya. The Sulahids were centered in the southern highlands with a very famous ruler, Queen Arwa, one of the female, well-known female rulers of the Arab world. And the others, the Beni Zuraya, were centered on Aden and the surrounding lowlands. These were two Shia dynasties, and clearly Saladin must have thought not for religious reasons, of course, but after having subdued and ended the Fatimid Caliphate in Egypt, he must have thought about ending these kind of outposts. At the same time, as we have heard, Aden was the center of the Indian Ocean of the world trade, if we may say so, and clearly, these economic reasons were also highly preponderant, maybe the most important ones. In 1173, Saladin sent his brother, Turan Shah, again to the other side of the Red Sea. He built a fleet which brought the heavy equipment over to Yanbu, near Makkah, and the troops also went over by ship, not from the north, but by ship, slightly south of, Al of, of Makkah uh, uh, in uh, what is today southern Saudi Arabia or northern Yemen, and marched from there southward, conquered Makkah, conquered Al-Ta'if, conquered uh, the Yemeni Tihama, and uh, the main city there, Zabid, and were in Aden in 1174. The year 1173, the conquest of Yemen by the Ayyubids, by Turan Shah, and in the name of his brother Saladin, is the most important date in the history of Yemen and in the history of the Indian Ocean. The Ayyubids at the time were the world's most modern dynasty. They had a very strong and competent economic program. They reorganized Egypt, Syria, Palestine, and their parts of Iraq. They reorganized them very similarly to what Colbert did in France under Louis XIV. The productivity and production in Egypt and Syria increased dramatically. And this system, based on a modern bureaucracy, 
which did not degenerate in a feudal system like in Europe, this modern bureaucracy was brought and imported into Yemen with the same results, a bureaucracy which through meritocracy ruled the country, an enormous increase in revenue and in local production, and an enormous increase in a wise administration of customs and foreign trade. This system was established within the very first decade of Ayyubid rule in Yemen. And it subsisted and was perfected under the successors of the uh, Ayyubids, their Amirs, the, the, the Beni Rasul, who had come with Turan Shah to Yemen and who took over from their Ayyubid overlords in 1228 and established themselves as the kings of Yemen, or in Arabic, the sultans of Yemen. The state of the Beni Rasul was the most splendid period of medieval Yemen, with an enormous activity in building, with an enormous activity in learning, with an enormous activity in commercial matters. The center, as I already mentioned, of this world was Aden. The trade in the Indian Ocean from time immemorial, from at least when we have that seal which was found, the Indian seal which was found in Phylaka, Phylacha, <laughs> um, uh, at least from this period, the trade was based on the monsoon winds. The monsoons, as you know, are due to the rotation of the Earth and the different temperatures between the equatorial regions of the Earth and the colder climates further up north. The monsoons also changed through the move of the axis of the Earth over the millennia. Basically, in the Indian Ocean re region, we have two seasons of monsoons. Between the 8th and the 16th of March, as we read in the Yemeni documents of this period, the ships left the south of India, the uh, Malabar coast, today's Kerala, left the south of India and sailed to Aden straight through the ocean, not as we would imagine along the coast, but straight through in one go from South India to Aden. The, about one month later, they returned from Aden, from Aden to India. In the other season, which was called at that period Daimani, which lasted November to March, ships sailed from northern India along the, along the coasts of Bilada Sin, Pakistan, Iran, and along the South Arabian coast, so this time at a certain distance, not along the coast, but at a certain distance, 10, 20, 30 kilometers from the coast to Aden. This journey was much faster, while the first one took approximately between four to six weeks. The second one took just two weeks. In June came the other leg, because Aden was the place in the middle where goods which came from Cairo had to be discharged for transport to India, and goods which came from India, Malaysia, and beyond had to be discharged in order to be transported on other ships to Egypt. Egypt was the, mainly the port of Aydab, which is today in this 
northern Muthallas Sudan, the, the, at, uh, roughly at the border between Sudan and Egypt. In June, uh, the ships from Cairo came from Aizab. They had traveled on the Nile and then by caravan to Aizab. They came to Aden. In October, they returned to Aizab, then by caravan to the Nile and to Cairo and Alexandria. And these traders were called Al-Karim. Much has been written about Al-Karim. It is still not clear who Al-Karim is, but it would seem that it is a general de denomination for powerful merchant families from Cairo engaged in the Indian Ocean trade, which means in the trade from Aizab to Aden. A few years ago, an extraordinary discovery has been made in Yemen. A document was found and published, published um, uh, in the series uh, of the French Institute in Yemen, uh, of documents of the customs and statistical documents of the final years of Sultan al mudaffar the most important Rasulid ruler of Yemen. This document contains all the details for several years of the customs administration in Aden. The goods, the prices, the duties to be paid, who were the merchants, who were the naqib of merchants, of the names of the ships, and how the Sultan guaranteed and interfered with this trade. This document is absolutely invaluable. We do have much documents from that period from Europe, because in cities, princely archives, these have been preserved. From the Arab and Muslim world, we only have the Jewish documents, which I mentioned at the beginning, from Cairo, and this collation of statistics from Yemen, from Aden, which has received the working title Nur al-Ma'arif. The final years, as I said, of al-Malik al-Muzaffar, about 1290 to 1200. 95. As I had mentioned before, the Rasulids had built upon the incredibly detailed administrative capacity of the Ayyubid state. When Turan Shah came to Aden, his troops were, of course, willing to plunder the city. They said, we have been traveling all that way, and we have lost so many comrades on our way. We want to have a reward. And Turan Shah told them, we did not come to plunder the city, but to make use of its income. And this continued for the next 200 years. Which were the goods traded? Exports from Yemen, something which we did not know before, but which we have discovered through the Nur al-Ma'arif, the main export from Yemen was horses, in enormous quantities, enormous quantities. And then coloring matters, matters fuva, wars, much paper production. Paper was not available in India, was not produced in India. It was produced in Yemen and in Egypt, and paper was a major commodity in that trade. Incense, of course, and cotton. What were the main exports of India? Pepper, we all know that. Clover, cinnamon, ginger, cotton, quantity-wise. But also, and we will come back to that, timber and iron. And transshipped from the Coromandel coast, which in Arabic was called Ma'bar, uh, which is southeast India, the products from China, particularly porcelain. What were the main exports of Egypt? 80% textiles. 
among the textiles, Mahdiya textiles from Tunis and Bunduki, of course, from Venice, but much also in quantity from northwestern Europe, the Rhenish countries, Belgium, Flanders, and England, cloth and woolen, woolen um, uh, fabrics, mastic, gall apples for making ink, saffron, antimon, potash, sugar, and soap. As I said, horses were the main commodity. Horses were the monopoly of the sultans. The sultans encouraged the transport and the, the breeding of horses in all the highlands of Yemen and their transport to Aden. It was not allowed to trade or even to export horses other through Aden. There was a place called Al Halka in Aden where the sellers, which were generically called Sana'aina, arrived with tens of thousands. I'm really measuring my words, tens of thousands of horses over the year, and were the Nuhadas, the captains, the owners, the Nuhadas of the India ships. Uh, bought them in auction. The Sultan levied two taxes, 60 dinar on import and 70 dinar from the highlands and 70 dinars uh, for the expo as export duty. On the whole, the Aden export trade was charged with three kinds of taxes. One was the general tax, the usher. One was a tax which provided for services, dilala. And the third one was called shawani. Shawani because the Rasulid sultans maintained a fleet of galleys in the Indian Ocean which protected convoys of merchantmen against the pirates, not only from Somalia, but from other places as well. The trade was very safe at the period because it was accompanied by these very fast galleys provided by the sultans. The trade was important, but there was another side to it. It was during this period that Muslim merchants from particularly from Yemen and also Hadramaut, but also from the Persian Arab Gulf and from Persia itself, established themselves on the East African coast, intermarried there, and founded the cities of Mogadishu, Kilwa, Mombasa, and others. The creation of the Muslim Arab Sahel in East Africa dates to this period. And the same is true for the Islamization of India. Clearly, there had been traders before. There had been settlements. There had been preachers of Islam. But during the powerful presence of the Rasulid sultans in the Indian Ocean and their state supported or state half-administered trade, this Islamization in India took its greatest step forward and was exploited very carefully by the Rasulid sultans. For the first time, we have the details now in the Nur al-Ma'arif, and we learn that in 46 cities in India, and in, well, for 64 notables, the Rasulid sultans provided sometimes salaries, but usually regularly robes of honor, which they presented to them, and enameled glass, which was probably produced in Egypt as gifts of extreme beauty and prominence, and we all know that some 
of the most wonderful examples of this summit of glass making are in the Dar al Athar al Islamiyah collection here in Kuwait. In some cases, also, the Rasulid Sultans nominated, nominated the judges in India and some in Malaysia. There was also trade from China not only to Ma'abar in India, but also to Aden. For instance, we have with Al Khazraji, Ali bin Hassan Al Khazraji, who tells us in the year 1303 of a ship from China which arrived in Aden uh, with the captain Abdul Aziz bin Mansur Al Halabi. Uh, he had an enormous wealth with him, silk, 300 different, um, 300 different kinds of, um, of um, uh, pepper, cinnamon, and other mosque, uh, um, uh, al-awani al-jazm, which means jade, al-muta'amida bil dhahab And um, uh, the ushur, the, the dime, only on this cargo, was 300,000 dirhams in Aden. At this time, we can speak about the first creation of a globalized world through two aspects, trading and ideological uniformity. Ideological uniformity, I mean Islam. I just mentioned that East Africa became part of the world circuits during these 150 years. The whole process was completed, if I may say, at this in about 1350. So East Africa was encompassed into the trading and intellectual relations of the world, and so was India. From the basis of the southern coast of the Arabian Peninsula, with its three ports in the hands of the Rasulids, Aden, the biggest one, Shehr, and uh, Dhafar, or Dhafar as it is usually pronounced. We can say that the Islamization of India and Indonesia, which has created the masses, the great masses of Muslims today in the world, which is, of course, as we all know, not the Middle East, but it is Indonesia, Pakistan, and India. This goes back to this period and to this period of commercial and intellectual globalization. I have not gone into detail for the trade beyond southeast India, beyond Ma'abar, or what we call it, the Coromandel Coast. But that was a second globalized world, which only sometimes, for instance, with that big cargo which I had mentioned, which came from China, from Guangzhou, directly to Aden, was part of that system of globalization. The main city in China were Muslim traders congregated by many, many thousands, was Guangzhou, south of Canton, of today's Canton, where the large Ashab Mosque was built in the year 1009. We have started with the Crusades. And you, may, you might have asked yourselves, where are the Crusades? It's all trade. Well, it was all trade, but there were also the Crusades. And clearly, during the Crusades, the Middle Eastern Muslim countries were in need not only of exchange as such, but of strategic goods which they could not obtain in the Middle East itself. These strategic goods were basically three. It was iron, iron for 
arms, of course. It was timber, timber for building, for stretching long rooms, large timber, and of course for shipbuilding, and it was tar. Tar is made today from many substances, even from oil, but in the Middle Ages it was made from pine wood and from coal, and it was a particularly prized European export good, um, absolutely indispensable for shipbuilding. So timber, iron, tar, and other metals, such as copper, tin, zinc, uh, quicksilver, and others, were exported from Europe, particularly from Germany, uh, were, were mining, took a, a great essa in, uh, uh, from around the late 10th century and in the 11th and 12th century. Clearly, during the Crusades, should Europe have allowed the Muslims to import freely the timber for their warships, freely the iron used for making weapons and armor, and the tar for building ships, what the Italian trading cities wished to export, they made their money with that. But Europe, popes and councils, issued regularly embargoes against the export of these goods to the Muslim world. These embargo, embargoes were not highly efficient. There was too much profit connected with the export of these goods, but to some extent they were efficient. To some extent they worked. And here came the other side of what I have described, the globalization and the penetration of the Indian Ocean from Africa to India and China and Sumatra by Muslim traders who procured timber and iron from India and gradually when the embargoes worked from Europe, timber was substituted by exports from India to Aden and from Aden to Egypt and Syria. We end with a word from Marco Polo. Marco Polo, when he heard about the fall of Akka, Akon, as we say in English, the last stronghold of the Crusaders in 1291, Marco Polo wrote, and this was made possible through the assistance to the Sultan of Cairo by the Sultan of Aden, who provided him with 30,000 horses. We conclude at this point, and uh, I will now show you for about five minutes a few slides which recapitulate what I have tried to say. Thank you. Oh, it works. It works. What is this? What is this? <laughs> or rather, let us ask, where is this? In the Kuwait National Museum. In a safe in the Kuwaiti National Museum. It is, of course, very large. It is, the original is approximately two centimeter in diameter. It is the impression of an Indus seal found in Phylaka, found on a container which was impressed. Those of you who have seen them before can recognize some Indus uh, writing on, on the basis. So clearly this is trade between India and the Middle East around the year 2000 BC. We jump, we jump to not to 1533, as this might suggest. Uh, we jump to the first century uh, AD, uh, the Periplus Maris Eritreae, the first sailor's handbook ever written and preserved, the manuscript 
uh, which dates to the 10th century approximately, is in Heidelberg. And this is the um, Editio Princeps, the, print, the first printed edition of the Periplus Maris Eritrae, which is in the collection of a gentleman in Berlin. This is, I, it's not very clear, the photo is not very good of the map, but what I wanted to say with this map is how the world looks different when you change the vision of the map. Usually when you speak about the Crusades or Europe and the Arab world, you have the Mediterranean. And you think Europe and the Islamic Arab world is something which has to do with North and South and the East Coast, the Levant of the Mediterranean. When you see this map, you see that the Mediterranean is marginal. It is just at the margins. This is the world. This is the world with its center here, with the development of East Africa, with all the trading partners here, and the trade via Sumatra to Guangzhou. This is the world, and yes, they are doing something over there. They call it crusades, but we don't really care about that. This is um, a manuscript that shows another aspect of the crusades. As you can see, this is the lion, an Islamic lion, not the one of Baibars, but roughly uh, it is the, uh, um, uh, it symbolizes the Ayyubid ruler, Al-Malik Al-Kamil. And this is the German eagle, of course. This is Frederick II. Uh, this shows the conclusion of the Treaty of 1229 uh, with the cession of Jerusalem, while Al-Aqsa Mosque remained, remained uh, in the hands of Muslims with all the anecdotes which go with it. This is another aspect from the time of the Fifth Crusade under uh, Al-Malik Al-Kamil where St. Francis uh, went from Damyat in order to make peace between Crusaders and the Egyptians or the Ayyubids, Al-Malik Al-Kamil, went to Cairo, was of course first arrested and then invited by Al-Malik Al-Kamil to speak um, to him in, uh, in the palace in Cairo. This is another aspect of the Crusades rather contrary to what we think, what it looked like. Well, the ships at the time which cruised the Indian Ocean were not very much different from uh, those which you at least know here from the museum and from the works of uh, Yaqub Yusuf al Hijji. This one is uh, Al Bayan, the famous Kuwaiti boom. This is the Petersburg uh, Hariri. This is Abu Zaid on his Indian Ocean ship, which probably looked like the Kuwaiti boom, which I have shown before. These are um, booms in Aden. Uh, I have still seen them, but this is not my photograph, which I couldn't find uh, in that time. This is, again, the monsoon regime in the Indian Ocean. This is a photo by, by Alan Villiers, uh, again from the Kuwaiti boom uh, uh, Al-Bayan. I could not resist to bring a photograph of Alan Villiers from old Kuwait. Again Al-Bayan. This is Marco Polo arriving in, in China and uh, transporting uh, very strange and, and fabulous goods and uh, uh, trying to trade and to deal with these goods. This is a very fascinating um, image also from the Livre des Merveilles of Marco Polo. Um, Marco Polo writes something which, which nobody would believe him, that merchants who came to China had to exchange their gold coins against paper money. And he writes, the Chinese 
do have paper money, and it works. It is very funny. It works. And this is the illustration of this should be Kubilai Khan uh, on the throne. Yes, we have said that the, this globalization of the Indian Ocean went beyond India until China. These are some Chinese junks, not very dissimilar from what they probably used to be at the time. This is a bit funny. We have seen Marco Polo uh, traveling on a ship, which he didn't, or, or at least only partially, in China. And this is Ibn Battuta, who traveled at least in this part of the world by ship, but here we have him on a camel. And this is a gravestone from Guangzhou of a Muslim trader, uh, which is bilingual in Arabic and China. This is a Dao being built um, near Al Maha, which I have, that's a photo of mine. And from that very Dao being built on the shore, I photographed that other Dao, which is of course not a Dao but a boom, uh, uh, off uh, the coast of Al, Al Maha. Well, that's it. No, no, it is not. It is not. That is the last one. This is, well, everybody knows. I won't even use the word what it is. Um, uh, everybody knows what it is. So it starts with A, with the word, with the letter A. And this instrument is the only one among the many scientific and works of art in, in the field of, of medieval Islamic astrolabes, which was made by a ruler, by the Rasulid Sultan al-Ashraf II in the year 1291. It is now in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. But the treatise which the king of Yemen wrote himself, where he details how he made that personally, he wrote a treatise of about 60 pages. This treatise has also been preserved, and it is in the National Library in Cairo. So we end with this, which shows the concern of the sultans of Yemen for trade, for science, for literature, for learning in the broadest sense, but also for the works of peace built on, built on trade. And it is due to them that the Indian Ocean can be considered the first example of globalization in the world. And it is going back to this period that the expansion of the Muslim world towards India and Indonesia goes back. Thank you very much.